Hi, I'm here with Peter Chapman. He is CEO of IonQ, and it's a quantum computing company with an interesting spin for mass adoption. Hi, Peter. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Larry. Thanks for having me today. So I guess let's just start at the top. Um, how'd the company get started and, and sort of what's your approach relative to, you know, some of the other players? So the company was founded um, by two professors, one at the University of Maryland and the other one from Duke. Um, and the two had written a scientific paper on the architecture on how to build a quantum computer. And um, one of the principals at NEA saw <clears throat> this technical paper and thought, this reads just like a business plan. And so um, the VC firm NE reached out, and that's how uh, INQ got started. They provided the initial seed money, and that was about five years ago, and we've taken off since then. So, so the, comp the, the two professors weren't exactly looking for funding per se? They just published this paper, and NEA basically saw it? Yeah, you know, usually, you know, somebody has an idea and you go chase them for money. This was just the opposite. Um, this is where actually the, the venture capital firm saw what, what they were doing. And literally the paper was um, the blueprint on basically all the building blocks necessary to build a quantum computer. And so they said, okay, let's go do this. And that's how it got started. That's interesting. So, you, so you're based in College Park? Yes, um, we're, just, we're just off the campus at the University of Maryland. So it's, um, we're in uh, office space, which is owned by the University of Maryland. So we're kind of a spin out, if you will, with the University of Maryland and Duke. Um, it's really both of those two universities. Yeah, it, it's just interesting because a lot of the quantum players, whether it's IBM or Honeywell, they all seem to be on the East Coast somewhere. Um, um, yeah, I think Maryland would like um, the next Silicon Valley or the next Quantum Valley or whatever you want to call it. Um, we'd like to be in the, you know, the DC area. So, um. so, so the thing that where IonQ stood out for me was sort of your, um, your approach to not only measuring power, but also, you know, kind of distribution in terms of making quantum more accessible in the data center and the cloud and all that. Um, I guess walk me through the approach and, you know, what do you, what do you see in terms of adoption curves and things like that? Um, well, we wanted to kind of uh, democratize, if you will, quantum. And so putting it onto the cloud um, really did two things for us. Um, one is it made it, you know, if you have $10 and a, a credit card, you can sign up for either an AWS account or an Azure account and you can actually get onto one of IMQ's computers and you can start running quantum programs. Um, and, you know, kind of like the computer business, um, you know, in the, in the future, uh, as people create applications, it could be large corporations that do it, or it could be some kid in a garage who comes up with kind of the quantum version of the spreadsheet. So we wanted to enable kind of a wide developer audience. Um, the other thing is, is that um, by forcing ourselves to be out on the cloud, it really means that the uptime of the quantum computer has to be very good. And so it took us about 14 months to uh, get to a point where the uh, quantum computer could stay online and be servicing jobs with a high uptime. It's one thing to do a laboratory experiment, write a paper, and then send it off. It's actually something else to build the product. And so by putting it up on the cloud, it really forces you into that latter mode of saying, okay, now we actually have to have this computer, which you know, most people expect computers to run all the time. So that's kind of the second aspect that was important for us. And then in terms of managing the power, you, you guys recently came out with, you know, some thoughts on, you know, how the how this will scale and how the adoption curve will happen and just how we think about quantum computing. Yep. Um, can you walk us through that a bit? Yeah, there's um, um, an industry benchmark called quantum volume, um, which is, you know, was um, suggested by IBM. Uh, the problem with that as a benchmark is that the numbers very quickly are going to get to a point where they have so many digits to it that we won't be able to 
have kind of English words to, to kind of explain them. Um, so uh, what we suggested was a new benchmark, which is largely based on quantum volume, but one where you took the log base two of it. And what that really gets you back is the number of usable qubits for your particular application. And so um, rather than having this really, really large number, which is maybe good for marketing, but um, in terms of you know, what, knowing whether or not a particular quantum computer, um, how many qubits you can use for your application, that's, we came up with this idea of algorithmic qubits. And so it's a much smaller number. It doesn't look as impressive as the quantum volume numbers but it's probably more realistic and kind of more useful. And that algorithm, uh, the algorithmic approach, that's, is that based more on the, um, the cloud model and data center model and sort of like real world adoption? Yeah, it's, it's, it's intending to get a, a benchmark which actually is meaningful to application developers. Um, if I tell you, you know, a quantum volume of 4.2 million, which is the quantum volume, um, for the, our latest uh, 32 qubit system. That doesn't tell you much, but at the same time, there's actually, that actually, if you took the, the log base two of it, it's actually um, 22 usable qubits. And that's kind of more interesting. It's like, okay, now I know kind of how many qubits I can use for your average application. Now there is probably applications where it would need, um, 22 would not work, and there's probably applications where more than 22 means 22 out of the 32 qubits, um, there's enough fidelity for you to create a, a quantum program and expect it to work. Okay. Um, as far as developing applications for quantum computing goes, I, I guess what inning are we in and when do you see that uh, picking up in terms of, you know, just real world applications and I mean, there are plenty of problems to solve. Um, yeah. actual programming for it seems to be, you know, big TBD. Yeah. Um, so we're in, um, I think BCG did a, a good job in explaining the three maturity um, kind of uh, steps of the market. Um, we're in the uh, NISC era, which is this noisy era of quantum computers. Um, what does that mean? That means that in a classical computer, if you were to multiply two times two, you would expect to get four. Um, however, in these early quantum computers, you get two times two and you get four plus and minus an error. And um, this in, the amount of error is important because if I was to do two times two times two times two times two, and I was expecting to get 128, that error, even a small amount of it, will compound. Instead of getting 128, I might get 128 plus or minus 100. And so now that's an answer which is no longer useful. So in the early era, it's all about having um, the smallest amount of error to allow the largest programs to run. In the middle uh, phase of the maturity of the market, it's about error correction. It's another way to get to, better, um, to a better error model. And then the, the last one is fault tolerant quantum computing. And that's kind of the holy grail. And there, it's all about um, you know, kind of how can you get to scale? How can you get to manufacturing of lots of quantum computers? Um, quantum computers are no different than classical in the sense that at some point you can only fit so many qubits on a chip. Then you have to figure out how to go to multi-core. Then you have to figure out how to go to multi-quantum um, processing units. And then finally, multiple quantum computers, which are all linked together with a, some sort of quantum network. And unlike a traditional network using ethernet, a uh, quantum network allows you to take all the individual quantum computers and bring them together with um, very little overhead and make it one big quantum computer. And that's the, the third and final stage. And that's kind of the holy grail, if you will, of the quantum where kind of everyone expects to be able to do drug discovery and you know, all the things that people talk about for use of quantum computers. Where, where does the software come into that? Or I guess at what stage do you think we'll see, you know, like a groundswell of applications? I know you can go on the cloud and try some things now, but 
Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting. It's actually surprised me in this, um, in this past year um, to see actual useful applications running on even our 11, um, you know, qubit machine. Um, people are doing really interesting work where they're starting to challenge classical um, computers for uh, handwriting generation, um, classification, kind of early machine learning models, um, early chemistry simulations. So, um, but those are all, you know, still kind of early examples of it. Um, we think that kind of in the, you know, you need probably 40 qubits or so to get to a point where you start to do things that you would rather do it on a quantum computer than on the cloud or on a, um, you know, on a supercomputer. And about 72 qubits, uh, and we're talking about algorithmic qubits, these useful qubits, um, then you get to a place where you probably start to take on supercomputers for certain tasks. And then, um, you know, you, you need to get into thousands of qubits to get to a point where you can start to really do really interesting things, things like uh, drug discovery and those kinds of things. What are some of the skills that developers are going to have to have? I mean, or, or does the cloud abstract it so, you know, all software developers can participate? That's a great question. Um, so I think in some cases you will see, probably even in, in this year coming, where uh, uh, somebody stands up an endpoint that maybe does, for instance, handwriting recognition or natural language processing, and they use a library that the library does the quantum part uh, for you, and you as an, as an end developer don't need to know how it was done on a quantum computer. And it's available in standard kind of, you know, it's, uh, Java and C Sharp and standard programming languages. Um, so I think many people will get kind of to, from that point of view, um, but then there's the people that want to create those endpoints. And that definitely, you're going to need some quantum, you know, programming skills. And luckily, there's lots of books and university classes. Um, there's a lot of push into education right now. So we would encourage people. That's kind of like saying um, you want to get down to the assembly language of the processor. So, you know, the question is, is, is that a skill set that you want to add to your toolkit? Or are you just going to wait for a higher level kind of abstraction layer to appear? So certainly there will be people that will dive deep at, the, at that. But many people, just like today, will wait for a library to come about that allows them to use a quantum computer. OK. Um, how much has the cloud, how much do you think the cloud's accelerated quantum computing? Well, it's funny. When I, um, when I first joined um, INQ, which is less than two years ago, people were saying quantum computers would never work. <laughs> so here we are 18 months later, and they're now available out on the cloud, and anyone can use them. So I think um, bringing them to the cloud has really changed the narrative um, in terms of kind of there was a lot of doubters. And now we're getting to a point where people are starting to realize, oh, it's, it's actually here. It actually works. So maybe we need to be spending more energy on this than we thought. So. I think if we had tried to do this on our own, it would have been a much more difficult um, you know, kind of sales, if you will. But having these things available kind of by the largest tech companies really helps that. Yeah, and the doubters were largely because of the temperatures needed to keep a quantum computer, right? Well, I, I think there was, there was doubts on lots of things, um, just like any, you know, just like any. I'm sure there was people back uh, when the Wright brothers were thinking about doing planes, there was lots of people who said, you know, that will never work too. And so the quantum industry has those as, as well. Um, but, you know, I think, that, for instance, you'd, you'd be unlikely to hear people say that today, a mere 18 months later. So Yeah, exactly. It, it's, it's, it's almost comical where it's come from. And, and basically, like you said, it's been 18 months. Um, yeah. It's gone from science project to something that's, you know, legit in a hurry. Exactly. So, so your background, you've hung out with NASA astronauts, you've done code, you've, your background's pretty colorful. Um, you know, so what can you, what did you take away from those experiences in terms of just innovation and, you know, how it applies to your job today? Um, 
So, you know, I'm, I've got, um, you know, my background is largely a, a software engineer. Uh, although, you know, back when I first started, um, no one was just a software engineer. You had to have a, a really deep hardware background because, you know, operating systems were being created. If you want to do uh, write an application, the first thing you did is you ported an operating system. And the next thing you did is you ported a compiler to a new piece of hardware. And that's where you started. Um, so I, I kind of find the current environment very similar to that um, kind of those early days. Um, we're busily working on a quantum operating system, which is um, you know, a, an operating system that keeps the quantum computer running, just the same way that um, kind of MS-DOS did in the early days. Um, so there's those kinds of things. Um, I think also, you know, for um, seven years, I worked for Ray Kurzweil, and that was all about, you know, kind of predicting the future and when um, technology would come into play and when was the right time to take advantage of it. And that gave me good training for thinking about quantum. And that's one of the reasons I decided to take this job is because one can see that, um, you know, again, when I first started, people were talking about quantum being 20 years away. Now suddenly it's less than 10 years away. And you know, we think maybe five years away. So, you know, but that's all good training for kind of um, raise kind of uh, experience kind of led to you need to be able to predict when these technologies are going to come online so that you can get ready for them. And so that certainly helped in terms of what kind of helping with quantum. So, so the lesson is you, you sort of got to have a little bit of a crystal ball or at least be able to sort of count. Yeah. You know, you know, if you mainstream adoption. Yeah, if you, we all actually, um, it's funny, we say crystal ball, but we all actually have the tool sets for it. We all know Moore's law. Like when when we did um, optical character recognition on a cell phone, we first predicted when would the camera be at a high enough resolution and enough memory on that cell phone. And we started uh, two years before we had a cell phone that was good enough to take a picture that you could do optical character recognition. So we it was important to start two years before, and we wrote the software on a PC, and then we waited, and sure enough, within a month of when we predicted there would be a, you know, a cell phone that could have that capability, it appeared. And then that led us to be, you know, have, have the first application of, of kind of OCR on a phone. And so that kind of prediction capability, it's actually not much of a crystal ball. You know, if you kind of look at it, you know, we all kind of know well, you know, what more Moore's law applies to communications and to processing speeds, all the rest of it. So if you just do that extrapolation yourself and say, well, what if I had the following kind of hardware in the future? What should I be doing today? You typically don't want to wait until it shows up today because that probably means there's lots of people who've already predicted that it's going to be here and it'll be used in the market. And that's kind of what we did at uh, Ray's company. Okay. Uh, anything to add about quantum adoption or anything else? Um, just that, uh, you know, I think, um, you know, like, like in the past, people um, don't realize how quickly quantum is coming. And so, and quantum, um, you know, is likely to change the world. It is much as um, the, P the microprocessor did. Quantum is likely to have that kind of impact on mankind. And so um, just like the early days of the computer business, those who saw that vision, you know, did very well. And so, um, you know, I think we're in that same kind of stage today for quantum. So we enjoy, you know, kind of um, hope that everyone will jump in and start to get their feet wet on quantum and start learning about it and use these early quantum computers to, to kind of get a pilot project going. And, um, and then hopefully in the next couple of years, we'll have a quantum computer big enough that, um, you know, you can start to do amazing things. So, um, the uh, water is warm. Come on in, you know, <laughs> jump in. So. All righty. Thanks a lot for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Larry.